Hey everybody, it's Ann Beebe. Today is Tuesday, June 2nd, 2020. I'm Barb Hammer. So um, it's a, uh, right now it would be June 3rd in Asia. And I wanted to talk about uh, Tiananmen Square, that color re revolution that took place in Beijing in China in 1989 in an attempt to overthrow the Chinese government. It was a CIA MI6 uh, operation. So June 4th is the uh, official anniversary that people commemorate and hold vigils for. Um, so in Asia, it's already June 3rd, uh, the time difference. So that's when events that culminated in the <laughs> crackdown no crackdown, no massacre happened. So uh, overnight, June 3rd, that's when the events started to happen. That's when protesters started to attack um, um, troops uh, with the People's Liber Liberation Army, uh, many of them unarmed. So the protesters used like mol Molotov cocktails and petrol bombs or whatever you want to call them. They even had firearms. Um, they are believed to have hijacked some of the armored vehicles. They torched uh, vehicles, um, burned, lynched soldiers, burned many of them alive. Just some really gruesome images. So anyway, I wanted to talk about that. I'm probably gonna have to do more than one video because there's so much about Tiananmen Square, very interesting. But I'm sort of seeing another sort of color revolution going on in the US and other people were kind of picking up on that. Anyway, um, first of all, I wanna say, um, this is all tied into, uh, there's a lot of censorship going on with the um, coronavirus um, psychological operation. That's another color re revolution going on in the West. And it's also to smear China. So there's a China tie in there. But um, now there's a lot of censorship going on about the protests over George Floyd's uh, murder at the hands of police. And so Scott was, uh, has um, been censored on YouTube. So he, he showed a video that he had seen on mainstream media, but uh, the particular video that he showed, the same, similar, you know, same thing was on Twitter, I think. And um, I didn't get to see the video before it was taken down. And then he appealed it and YouTube gave him a community strike for appealing. And so he has a seven day suspension where he can't upload videos. Um, and he's very pessimistic. He thinks they might very well give him another community guideline strike and take down his channel by the end of the seven day suspension. So it's not fun. Anyway, um, so he's been uploading videos on BitChute and uh, trying to keep them short because there are problems with BitChute. And BitChute wouldn't even, uh, they refused, they rejected his video. Uh, the one that YouTube had removed, he wasn't able to upload it there. Um, so I've been providing a mirror of his videos on my channel, his BitChute videos I've been putting on my channel. Um, while he's uh, experiencing the suspension. And I hope he will be able to upload videos again at the end of the suspension, but we'll see. I'm not sure right now. So I'm just trying to be supportive, as supportive as, supportive as I can. And my channel has been become practically his channel because I haven't uploaded anything else um, until now. Uh, so anyway, I hope Scott can come back to YouTube, um, because we miss him. Anyway, so I want to talk about Tiananmen Square, but it also ties into what's going on in the U.S. right now. And it's like the chickens are coming home to roost. So there is, seems to be a color revolution, really. There already was one, I guess, with the COVID, the coronavirus, uh, pandemic and lockdown. Um, but now we're seeing another, there is definitely another color revolution going on, um, over the protests, um, and the police response, uh, a lot of paid protesters, there are Ajahn provocateurs, and I started seeing things 
that reminded me of another color revolution that's been going on in Hong Kong since last year. And I've learned a lot since last year's 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square color revolution. So I did a video a year ago and I watched it again and I kind of was amused because it's when I was really just waking up about all the propaganda about China. And uh, so this is what started it. I uh, realized, I, I started looking at the coverage last year of Tiananmen Square and realizing um, there was no massacre, there was no crackdown. People were killed 200 to 300, not the thousands or tens of thousands. And there's a lot of lies about Tiananmen Square. And that's when I started to realize there's uh, so many lies about China. So many lies. I'm very skeptical whenever I see Western reporting about China. And it's very negative. I'm very skeptical and I will look into it more. And I usually find it's just uh, in mainstream media, it's just they're just reporting pure Western intelligence propaganda is really all they're doing. Um, the propaganda machine is huge um, to smear China. And uh, so since this video, um, and I will give you a link to this video, and I've learned so much more about Tiananmen Square and color revolutions and I wasn't familiar with um, a figure um, back then named uh, Gene Sharp. So Gene Sharp kind of, he's sort of the, the, the godfather, godfather of the color revolution. He kind of perfected it. So he was a, I guess, worked with the Pentagon, um, CIA. Um, um, so it's been privatized, that whole industry, color revolution industry. So uh, National Endowment for Democracy is the main NGO, non-governmental organization front for the CIA, for these regime change operations and color revolutions. So um, this is a video I did, I made a video about Gene Sharp and I just kind of skimmed the surface really. There's so much about Gene Sharp and color revolutions um, and I'm still learning more and more. So this was a link into, uh, from a video that I made about Gene Sharp. So this is the Chinese version of how to start a revolution. And it's about Gene Sharp and his methods. And uh, I had picked this one because it's in English, but it has Chinese subtitles for Chinese viewers so they could watch it and enjoy it more. Um, so there's a little segment here where he talks about Tiananmen Square. And here's some images. So I'm just gonna play this without the sound. I can't record the sound anyway, so. Yeah, there's Chemex where 19, and those are the crowds. Plan a strategy. And that's Gene Sharp. Uh, he passed away a year or two ago. Yeah, the more images of Tiananmen Square. Yeah, so there were hundreds of paid assets who were involved in leading the protest protests. Um, but most people, there were so many people that came out, they were just people protesting because there were legitimate problems going on in China. But they, these people did not realize um, that this was an attempt to overthrow the government <laughs> and became violent. So most people who were involved, they, they, they did not know. They did not know. So this is him talking about it. And I think there's some more images here. Yeah, so these are the military that were trying to contain the crowds. You know, it was getting out of hand. Yeah, that's Tiananmen Square. That's in the square. Oh, and this is when a... Uh, um, where Kaishi, I forget. Uh, he was actually a Uyghur. That's he. That's one of the paid assets, and he was rewarded afterward. So they got an Operation Yellowbird. Yellowbird, um, all these paid assets, hundreds of them, eight hundred, yeah, maybe eight hundred. I think were brought out of China, um, and they were rewarded with uh, Ivy League educations uh, or at prestigious schools. Uh, sometimes. And they were smuggled out through Hong Kong and they went to France. And then um, uh, perhaps some of them went to the UK. I don't know. Uh, I know there was at least one went to, uh, 
went to the Sorbonne in France, uh, but mostly Ivy League schools or very prestigious schools in the U.S., like Stanford and University of Chicago. Yeah, so that's one of them being carried. Yeah, he was a Uyghur, actually. He was a Uyghur. And I think there's some more images. Aha, and this is, you know, very symbolic of the color revolutions is you'll have in foreign countries where there's a color revolution, you have signage in English, you know, and that's for a foreign audience. Yeah. So we no longer trust dirty public servants. We don't like the evil government. We trust Mr. Democracy. Yeah, democracy. And democracy. Whoops. Democracy is just no, no way. I'm trying to get out of that. There we go. So democracy, that's just code for neoliberalism. Democracy, uh, freedom, human rights. Yeah, that's uh, corporate neoliberal uh, economic <laughs> policy, really. Yeah, that's what that is. Theory. There we go. Images, images, images. Yes. I think that might be it. I think there's another image here. So this is him talking, talking, talking. Yes, bodies. So color revolution, you gotta have bodies, lots of dead bodies, and who knows who they are. those people are. Um, they might be soldiers. There were civilians. Some of the protesters were killed. Um, um, many, many people were wounded, actually. Many people were wounded, so... Um, uh, anyway, so that's Tiananmen Square. The, that's Jean Sharp. Anyway, that's Jean Sharp. Um, some very interesting stuff about Jean Sharp. Um, oh, yeah. So I did a video. So everything seems to tie back to Tiananmen Square. So this new security law that's been proposed for Hong Kong, where they've had a color revolution, a violent, very violent color revolution since last year. That's been... That goes back to Tiananmen Square, the Chinese government. They do not want these color revolutions anymore. Um, I wrote I wrote an article last year. This is my blog with one article, but it's a good article. And it still holds it up. And it's Hong Kong protests, protests, just the latest lie about China. So it just kind of gives you a big picture view of the Hong Kong protests and how that ties into Tiananmen Square and all the propaganda about China. So I'm going to have to, I've been do, doing a lot of propaganda watching, uh, watching propaganda uh, documentaries about Tiananmen Square. So I've watched, uh, and strangely, I think they're both from PBS, Public Broadcasting Service, um, which is really, I just call it propaganda brainwashing. So I watched one called Tank Man, what's, um, which is... Maybe 20 years old, I think, maybe, maybe less. And then I've been watching The Gate of Heavenly Peace, which sounds so lovely, but it's um, like three hours long. And uh, I've been writing down, I've been taking notes, and there's so many names. So I'm getting the names of all these assets. So when you watch these documentaries about Tiananmen Square, um, all the people interviewed, uh, the Westerners, they're propagandists, you know, journalists or human rights figures, you know, from these NGOs, human rights NGOs, regime change NGOs. And I've been writing down names of the assets who are interviewed. And I just enjoy watching people lie on camera. I don't know. It's fascinating. Um, very interesting. So this is, uh, there are lots of articles about Tiananmen Square. Um, this is a very, very good one. And towards the end, there's some very interesting so it's images here. Images. There's Tank Man. That's the Tank Man video. So lots of images. Um, this is a gruesome one. Yeah, they lynched. They lynched the soldiers, burned them alive. Anyway, so towards the end, uh, it's interesting. So what exactly happened in Beijing in 1989? And to understand the chaos... Let's start with the two most important people in the story, Hu Yabang and James Lilly. So Hu Yabang was the chairman and general secretary of the Communist Party of China. He was a reformer. And so reforms usually mean introducing market, a market system. Yes, so he was a reformer and was liked by young people. He died on April 15th, 1989. 
But without his death, there would probably have been no drama in China that year. College students initially gathered at the Tiananmen Square only to mourn his death. Um, but this is the thing, I think it says later on. So with these color revolutions, there's always an event to trigger. So they're planning, 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 but there's gotta be an event to trigger. They'll say, okay, here's an opportunity. So the regime change assets organizers, ah, here's an opportunity. So that's what happened. And that's what's happened with the George Floyd uh, murder. Same as with the, um, the COVID <laughs> outbreak pandemic. Um, and in Hong Kong, a law, it's always over a law that's introduced to stop the color revolutions or to um, create a better uh, uh, legal system in Hong Kong. Anyway, so um, the call, yeah. So within a day or two after Hu Yaobang's uh, death, the U.S. realized that hundreds of thousands of young people would be congregating in Beijing. It was the per perfect time for a coup since the rest of the world was dismantling communism that year. Yeah, so that's when the Soviet bloc, oh yeah, I made a video about that. Yeah, yeah. Soviet bloc was falling apart that year. Um, so going back here, okay. Uh, thus, on April 20th, 1989, five days after Yao Bang's, Hu Yao Bang's death, I don't know how they have Yao Bang's, who is his name, his family name, who, five days after Hu Yao Bang's, who's death, James Lilly was appointed as the U.S. ambassador to China. He was a 30-year veteran from the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. And they cite an article from Vancouver's son. Um, the Central Intelligence Agency had sources among Tiananmen Square protesters. Yeah, not just sources, but assets, paid, trained assets. They were smuggled out into Hong Kong and trained there in the back end. And they might have brought some people from the outside, smuggled them into China. Uh, I think that's very much the case, probably. And for months... Before the protest, the CIA had been helping student activists form the anti-government movement. To help the U.S. intelligence, there were two important people. This is very interesting. George Soros and Zhao Ziyang. Soros is legendary for organizing grassroots movements around the world. Like He's, he's a big backer of Black Lives Matter now and Antifa which is um, uh, they are taking part in these George Floyd uh, protests and um, not all, but violent. Yeah, often being violent and paid to be violent. Now, not, not all the Black Lives Matter protesters are, are violent. A lot of people who are just legitimately, that's the thing, you get people who are legitimate, have legitimate grievances to take part in these protests and they are not aware of the bigger agenda. So um, in 1986, he had donated $1 million, which is a, was a lot of money in China in those days, uh, it still is, to the fund, to the fund for the reform, reform and opening of China. Over the next three years, Soros' group had cultivated and trained many pro-democracy student leaders. Pro-democracy, you hear that term in Hong Kong. They're fascists. Uh, they're uh, neoliberal, <laughs> uh, corporate neoliberal globalists. Anyway, so pro-democracy student leaders. Who would spring into action in 1989? The National Endowment for Democracy. Now that's the CIA's main uh, NGO front, and that was created in 1983 after one year after Ronald Reagan's Westminster sp speech that he gave in London. So the national, the NED also opened offices in China in 1988. NED is also another regime change organization. Organization, yes, it is. Yes, it is. So I will usually say CIA NED because the NED is just a front for the CIA. It's been privatized. 
neoliberalized. Anyway, and who would allow all these Western fake NGOs? Zhao Ziyan, who was the premier of China and the big secretary the, and the general secretary of the Communist Party. He was a big fan of privatization and Milton Friedman. That's neoliberal economic theory, yes. His close advisor, Chen Yizi, uh, headed China's Institute for Economic and Structural Reform, an influential neoliberal think tank. Um, by the way, after the protest, Soros and his NGO were banned in China. Zhao Ziyang was purged and placed under house arrest for the rest of his life, and Chen Yizi escaped to America. So, yeah, I had heard, someone had told me that Zhao, uh, that Soros had paid off Zhao, so uh, Zhao was um, an asset, and apparently his advisor was too. And anyone who escapes to the U.S. is is very well uh, rewarded. Anyway, so another Westerner who played a significant role in the Tiananmen Square agitations is Gene Sharp, who's the author of Color of Revolution manuals and the subject of an acclaimed documentary called How to Start a Revolution. He was in Beijing for nine days during the protests and wrote about it. Of course, he didn't reveal his role, but it's not hard to imagine. Gene Sharp worked closely with the Pentagon, the CIA, NED, etc., for decades and fomented uprisings all over the world. Yeah, so I think um, he was busy in the 80s. They were, this was not, I don't know, this was a pivotal color revolution, but I don't, this was not the first one. And it was, it was a, it was um, a phenomenon that was known before he came along. So, uh, uh, in Iran, when Mohammad Mossadegh was overthrown in 1953, that was a color revolution too. So the influence of Westerners in Tiananmen Square is obvious looking at all the large signs in English, yes, expressing American ideals. Give me democracy or give me death. Yes, there you go. Signage in English. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Um, yeah, so there were problems here with the uh, transition to, um, yeah, two more facts to be noted are that the Chinese government did not impose a martial law until May 20th, and there were no major clashes between the military and the people until the very end. Here's a picture of protesters giving food to the Chinese soldiers, so all very nice, and then they turned on them later. As for the students, they were not a monolithic group. They fell under a few different categories. Those who suffered from, um, so there were economic problems here. Um, and they were, they thought democracy and freedom was uh, the solution. Um, but um, what they were demanding was not going to improve their economic situation. It was going to make things worse. You know, neoliberalism does not improve uh, the lives of people at all. No. Um, so student leaders were unscrupulous. Oh yeah, they were really disgusting. Most top student leaders escaped from China. The CIA called it Operation Yellowbird right after the protests, came to the US and went to Yale, Harvard, Princeton, etc. thanks to generous help from the US government. And they were provocateurs and thugs like we're seeing right now in the US. So um, they were the minority, but um, could significantly escalate tension. This strategy based on mob role psychology works very effectively all over the world. Very few people, for example, realize that some of these provocateurs had guns. Yes, they had guns, they had petrol bombs, they had, uh, I don't know, uh, weapons, all, and they are believed to have hijacked some of the uh, militarized uh, vehicles, um, tanks or whatever. Um, yeah, so Chai Lang, she's really disgusting. She she admitted that she wanted uh, blood and violence. Um, yeah, so they wanted this massacre to try to bring down, it was the last resort, I think, to bring down the government. Um, so then they created this narrative to smear um, the Chinese government. Yes, anyway, that's very interesting. Yeah, that's Tiananmen Square. So. Um, 
Yeah, so we're seeing a color revolution in the U.S. And there's an article here. I don't agree with this. That I don't think they're necessarily trying to bring Trump down, but it's impose uh, justify bringing in the troops and imposing martial law and cracking down. Um, so in that sense, it's a color revolution, a regime change, um, just to make things even worse in the U.S. And uh, it's just. It's strange that they've uh, picked this uh, George Floyd um, murder. You know, I mean, it is a serious problem, police brutality, particularly against minorities, um, disproportionately against minorities, uh, African-Americans in particular. Um, indigenous people are treated terribly too, but uh, there aren't merely, nearly as many. Um, but it's, uh, the police brutality is uh, really against, uh, based on class and uh, poor people are the ones who suffer the most. And, you know, a lot of minorities are poor and that's just the way it is. Um, but why this George Floyd, it just became viral in mainstream media. And that's what this article was kind of saying, um, you know, it's just bizarre. And then even Nike had an ad endorsing the protest. So, you know, there's something wrong um celebrities jumping on board so you know this has been hijacked and the imagery of uh umbrellas and bricks and uh brutal beatings like in hong kong and other color revolutions um yeah very very suspicious um um there's a lot of information about how you know they they've learned these they learn these methods from every color of what works and so they've learned what worked in hong kong and so these uh, people orchestrating this uh, are telling paid protesters to use umbrellas, whatever. All very, very suspicious. And the left, you know, the the fake left that was on board with the COVID lockdowns, um, they're they're upset about the um, police brutal, the police uh, response to the protest. You know, they're not questioning. They just say, "Well, yeah, we all have to social distance." Well, they don't seem to have a problem with. Um, these protests where there's no social distancing. I don't know, it's just strange. And then on the right, they oppose the lockdown over the virus, but they um, they support martial law, um, cracking down on looters, whatever, these paid people that are being violent and looting and smearing the protest. People are legitimately protesting. So it's just a mess. It's just a mess, but anyway, um, it's just the chickens coming home to roost and it all goes back, back in the square. That's what's amazing. Uh, 1989, I talked about it. it was a very, very pivotal year. So, and what's going on in Hong Kong and China has tried to stop these color revolutions ever since. And now the chickens have come home to roost and there's a color revolution going on in the U.S. I mean, I, I could see it with the COVID virus outbreak, but um this is even worse so um over the george the protests and it's global it's not just in the u.s so they gone global the george floyd protests have gone global so the covid virus psyop and now this um it's just crazy i can't get over this but i'm so glad i started waking up last year and realized the lies you know what happened at tiananmen square and learning about color revolutions and Hong Kong, and now I'm seeing it in the U.S. and in the West, particularly in the U.S. And I don't think it's to bring down Trump. Um, he's doing everything the ruling class wants. So I don't know. You know, he's just a puppet, he's a figurehead. So I think it's just changed the system to impose fascism, martial law, martial law, make things really a real lockdown. There are curfews. There were curfews with the uh, COVID lockdown, but now there's even worse. The curfews are even worse. It's just really scary. Anyway, I don't know. It's amazing how Tiananmen Square is just, it's so important to understand Tiananmen Square. And then uh, then I can under, I, I understand what's going on in the U.S. now. It's very sad. Um, Anyway, that's it for now. I'm going to talk more about Tiananmen Square and I've got to talk more about Hong Kong, but I just want to put that out about what's going on in the U.S. and it's all very familiar to me right now. Anyway, thanks for listening and I will talk to you again soon and watch Scott's videos on my channel when you can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, talk to you again soon. Bye.